Hope everyone is doing great. Uh, it's three o'clock. We're going to um, get started and we have a couple more people logging in right now. So we're gonna get started just in a couple minutes, maybe two or three minutes. And um, we're gonna talk with Arnold Vanderwood, um, who's been, was in the US Navy for 22 years. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk with him. He, uh, he's, I've known him for a little while and just a great guy. I always feel better after talking with them. So I can't wait to share that with everybody here. Um, so everyone's on mute. Um, please stay on mute um, and uh, we'll make sure it's clear for everyone. And uh, we're gonna get started in uh, probably just two or three minutes here. That's All right, again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks again for dialing in. Um, hope uh, we're able to kind of escape for a little bit, little bit for the next half hour. Um, have a great conversation with, um, with just, a, I think, an amazing man, Arnold. Um, so we, um, I kind of got this started to just provide. Um, you know, a little relief from everything that's going on. Um, one, I hope everyone is staying healthy, staying safe out there. And um, anyone that has come down or knows someone that has come down with um, you know, COVID-19, uh, my thoughts and prayers go out to you and your family and I uh, hope you're staying safe and healthy. Um, I have a couple of things that I gotta get out of the way here. One is just uh, some important disclosures that Anytime I talk, I need to uh, put out there. So let me just get these on the screen for everybody. Um, important disclosures. Um, but um, we put this together today um, really uh, because I was actually struggling um, with this whole thing that happened a couple of weeks ago when it first got started. I did not really know what to make of it. And I really, I think I didn't have the great, a great kind of attitude looking at everything in, in the right mindset. And um, and I got, and I was, I was scheduled to have a phone call with Arnold. And um, at the time, right before I talked to him is, is I was, I was just in a, I was in a bad state. I was, I was, I was upset about everything that was going on. I had a really bad perspective on things. I, um, I was thinking like, why is this happening? Why is it happening to me? And that week, I was talking with a lot of people who were really concerned with their investments, really concerned with their families and things that were going on. And um, I started to kind of get the magnitude of what was happening. And I just got off the phone with a couple of people um, that were 50, 60 years old and really concerned because um, they were at um, a time when they were getting ready to start using some of their investments in a time when they were um, really the most vulnerable to the COVID-19 and the, the, the senior and older generation. So it really hit me. I was like, wow, this is, this is much bigger than myself. And, I've, and I thought to myself, you know, I got to start calling people like that that are, you know, maybe are a little scared right now. And um, Arnold was one person that came to mind and he's 82 years old. Um, he's retired. And I was like, man, I have to call Arnold. I hope he's doing well. And I started getting really concerned and worried because he's, you know, at, at the most vulnerable age and stage for this thing um, from a financial perspective and from a health perspective. So I was dialing his number and I was like, I was really getting worried. And I got on the phone and I go, hey, Arnold, how are you doing? And I was like getting ready for him to, to be concerned and worried. And I could hear him on the other side of the phone with a big, huge smile. I'm doing great, Jim. And I was, like, I was like, really? I can't believe that. Like, what do you mean you're doing great? You're 
you're the most acceptable to this thing. You're, you know, your investments are down and you're using them and you need them right now. And it's like, how are you possibly doing great? And uh, he goes, well, Jim, um, you know, I, I grew up on a submarine in a lot smaller spaces and environment than this quarantining, what we're doing right now. Um, and he immediately put a smile on my face. Um, so I wanted to share kind of his perspective with everyone um, and kind of share, you know, what he's learned and and find out what's worse, living on a submarine or being quarantined, stuck at home. Um, so Arnold's been in the was you was served 13 tours in the U.S. Navy as a submarine um, technician from 1956 to 1978. He retired from the U.S. Navy before I was even born. <laughs> Um, so he has a lot of great wisdom to share. Um, really happy to be to know Arnold. And um, without further ado, um, two quick things is Arnold. Before we bring on Arnold, is I also want to share our next um, event, next webinar, web, next webinar that we're hosting, which is what I learned from the coronavirus, um, where I learned from financially and just from life. Um, it's going to be having two weeks from now, Wednesday, April 29th at 4 p.m. And the 10 things I learned from talking with over 100 different people and investors, mistakes that they've made during this time, rules they know, and three things you can do now. Uh, so I'll send out that information to everyone on here and look forward to talking to everyone then as well. Um, but without further ado, my main man, um, Arnold Vanderwood. Hey, Arnold. Okay. Hello, how are you? How's everyone? Uh, we're doing hopefully good. good. Yeah, I think everyone's doing really great. Um, so thanks a lot for joining us today. I wanted to just start off with you were you, you know you served in the U.S. Navy and submarines. How did you know that you wanted to even get into doing that? How did you know you wanted to be in the Navy and, and work on submarines? Well, it, 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 actually, that's kind of kind of strange because um, when I was a youngster, um, there was a, a fellow living in the, in our house as a uh, when I was a teenager. There was someone living with us that uh, was a submarine sailor, an ex submarine sailor from from the Second World War, and. Uh, he was such a an engaging person. He had such a great outlook on life. He was uh, uh, he he had had lost a leg in the war, but uh, he was still, you know, such a such a great uh, fellow. He always had good stories to tell, and funny stories. And he was he, he impressed me a lot. So that when I uh, you know, I always thought, "Boy, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to join the Navy and go into submarine service." You know, and I did, and I actually I did when I was 17. Um, I did. I joined the Navy. I didn't get into submarines, uh, you know, right away, because that's a volunteer force. It's a, uh, it's all volunteer, and there was apparently no real access at the time I first joined the Navy, but. Uh, one of the things I learned about uh, uh, coming into the Navy was that uh, it's like uh, when you you turn over your life to someone else, like like the military, <laughs> you you learn very quickly that you don't have much control over <laughs> over your life. You know, you uh, uh, you lose control over where you go. You know what you do in some cases. So you're limited in what you have control over. And, how, did you, uh, and how did you learn to deal with that part of it? Like you're 17, you're a teenager, you have kind of complete control almost. You think, uh, you think at least. How long did it take? Yeah. You didn't have control, and then what? You, what did you do? Well, it it was it it's kind of difficult at first because <laughs> here here I am. You know, I I I um, I didn't like going to school. And so I, I kind of walked away from school. I quit school and uh, wound up joining the military. But then no sooner did I get into the military uh, almost right away. And what did they do? They sent me to school. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, right away you learn, whoa, no control. <laughs> 
And, wow. uh, but it, it actually, they put me to work and, uh, and I was, uh, it turned out that the information I was learning, I, I learned how to be, uh, well, I learned, uh, electronics. I was a year in electronics school and, uh, and it was fascinating. Plus all the people I was working with, they were very, very dedicated. And, uh, so you wound up uh, very quickly realizing that within the within the space that you have, you you do the things you like to do within that space, mm -hmm. and and uh, and you you, you know, it didn't take long really to get used to that sort of life, uh, and it turned out that uh, within a couple of years, I realized that I really enjoyed the military life, and so I wound up deciding later on to you know stay with it for well i was in for 23 years yeah but but uh one of the things the biggest thing that uh uh i learned is that with with that training i would uh, t i look back today and i say without that training i would have uh you know wound up a very very different kind of person a different kind of life mm. uh had I had I not uh, been assigned to those kinds of duties in the in the military, uh, I don't think I would have been very successful in life. Wow! Uh, you know they I you know they taught me. Um, well, uh, they gave me really a uh, uh, you know the the ability to. Uh, uh, learn a, a trade a really good trade and uh and also you know i, I don't think i could have uh, survived outside having quit high school uh, and i didn't know anything at the time mm. so joining the military was the smartest thing that i ever did wow so but, there's some, uh, some silver linings inside of there uh, I, absolutely yeah. And one of the things I took away from that is, as you said, do what you like to do within the life, within the life that you have or what you're given at that moment. In time. That, right. That's how yeah. all of a sudden you started enjoying school and you started enjoying being around people and you, and you created a path of success for yourself. Well, that's true. And you, and you have to, uh, you know, th there's no point in, um, in fighting or arguing against things that you don't have control over. That makes no sense. It's kind of like uh, uh, when you called that day and you asked, well, how are you doing? I said, I'm doing okay, you know? And uh, you were, I noticed you, were, I know you were kind of concerned about, <laughs> you know, my uh, uh, ability to survive such, you know, the financial situation that's mm -hmm. existing. And, uh, and in reality, I've been with the, uh, uh, you know, with the market for many, many years and learned, one of the biggest things I learned is uh, <laughs> that the market is a, a long-term uh, investment and you, and you have to just stay with it. And there's not a whole lot you can do to control what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I learned that mostly in the Navy and, mm -hmm. uh, the biggest thing that, uh, uh, in f fact, you're right. Do the things you can do within the confines of what you're given. Not everybody can do everything they want. That's pretty obvious. But yeah. uh, so you you have to make do with what you have. Mm. So in the in the military, they they provided me a certain. Uh, uh, direction to go and uh, and I just followed it and did the best I could one th one thing that I learned is uh, if you fight it you're gonna lose mm. you know you you can't fight what you can't control mm. so if, if you're in a situation that you can't control then there's no point in fighting it so you you live with what you have and learn to you know, the other thing I did is I learned to uh, accept that situation 
and uh, and enjoy what you can do. Like I was, I was sent to a, a ship shortly after, shortly after uh, um, finishing up school. Here I was, a, a, a newly trained electronics technician, and they sent me to a ship, a very large ship. Uh, it was a cruiser, uh, and uh, you know, with uh, 900 people on board. And one of the first things I uh, uh, I was assigned to was uh, I don't know if you yeah, understood this term, but mess cooking. <laughs> okay. Down there, to, yeah, the scullery. <laughs> the, you know, down in the uh, in the kitchens, peeling to me to potatoes, cleaning, uh, you know, eating trays, uh, every, and. And I said, I'm thinking to myself, well, boy, I, did I go to school all this time for that? <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, uh, you know, everybody had, everybody that came aboard was, uh, you know, a, a new uh, a new sailor. Uh, everyone was assigned that, those kinds of duties because somebody had to do it. So... And I remember one of my one of the people that came on board with me, who was also uh, an, uh, an electronics technician, just come out of school. Uh, he wound up uh, fighting against uh, doing that kind of work, and and for the next two years, uh, he was he was not liked on board at all, and he couldn't get anything accomplished because of his attitude at that time about working in the scullery. Well, me, I get down there, okay, I learned how to peel potatoes quickly. <laughs> but, <laughs> and learn how to serve food. And and it was, uh, it turned out to be a lot of fun because uh, I wound up learning new things that I never, never could possibly uh, would have done on my mm -hmm. own. But anyway, I, I uh, was able to, uh, I spent three, three and a half years on that ship and, uh, and advanced to a nice uh, uh, position. And, uh, and at the point I was, uh, uh, I was also, we were, that ship, by the way, uh, was one of the uh, uh, President Eisenhower's uh, favorite, uh, uh, well, I guess one of his uh, projects, President Eisenhower's, one of his projects was to uh, make the U.S. Navy a, uh, and, and the military, the U.S. military in general, uh, worldwide ambassadors for the United States. Mm -hmm. So the ship that I was on was the USS Canberra, and it was sent on a round the world cruise. And we, uh, the ship was named after the capital city of Australia. And we were sent around the world to visit all kinds of ports all over the place. And one of them was in Australia. Uh, well, actually two of them. We visited uh, two cities in Australia, Sydney and Melbourne. And oh, great time. <laughs> Couldn't have been, uh, we, we were received like uh, you wouldn't believe it was uh, to use a phrase from uh, President Trump. Oh, you wouldn't believe that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, it was an excellent time. And uh, those uh, that tour around the world cruise was superb. Excellent. We learned so much about other countries. And uh, we studied the various countries that we were going to and learned about their culture, learned about their music. We even had, we had a glee club on board, at, which I was a part of, by the way. Oh, really? And yeah, it was fun. They and, glee uh, back then, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it was really a lot of fun. And we learned various songs from various countries. Uh, before we visited the country, we practiced, uh, you know, uh, songs that we would deliver once we were there we had a great time that that tour that trip lasted about six months traveling around the world it was excellent 
Um, well, but uh, shortly after that, I wound up uh, uh, being transferred to Hawaii and I was uh, at shore duty in Hawaii. And I spent about a year, a year and a half there in just, just after Hawaii became a state. And uh, I got there and, and uh, I was a nice little base in the middle of Oahu and uh, excellent. I mean, the weather, absolutely beautiful. You couldn't ask for anything better. But one of the things that bothered me about being there was I asked if some of the people, a couple of the guys that I uh, was bunking with, that, uh, you know, to ask me, I asked them about uh, visiting different places around the, the island. And uh, some of them said, oh, I've been here a year, haven't been anywhere. And I, I couldn't believe that. Mm. He says, how would you go to Hawaii, spend a year there, and not see anything. Yeah. But they were they were so negative about wow. being isolated, they thought, on an island in the Pacific, that they never got this chance to enjoy uh, the beautiful island of Hawaii. I was there in 1960. It was absolutely marvelous. Yeah, wow. And uh, so I, I spent my tour there not only learning a lot about, you know, things that I had to do with the Navy, but just touring around the island and just seeing the amazing things that were going on. So there's two different people there that had two completely different experiences. You yes. got to see a lot, enjoy a lot. You're in the same exact spot as someone else who probably came out of there and would have said that Hawaii was nice, but not for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, they, they didn't even try to, to uh, find out what the island was all about. And that, that disturbed me right away about them. So right. it's a matter of attitude. Mm. You know, if you don't have a positive attitude, um, you know, you're, you're, never, you're not going to, I, I think, you're not going to enjoy what life you have. Right. So... So part of it, to the, um, the U.S. Canberra, the cruiser ship you were on, the U.S. Canberra. Yes. Are most ships named after other, like other countries, or they mostly named after the no. United States? Or? No. This 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 particular ship was named after the capital city of Australia, uh, because, and that's the only ship in the Navy that's named after a foreign city. Still to, to today, as far as you know? Oh, still today. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, most of those ships, the cruisers and so forth, are named after cities. Battleships are named after states. Uh, many, uh, like, uh, aircraft carriers are named after uh, great Americans, hmm. usually, nowadays. And uh, But the reason that the, the USS Canberra was named that it happened in the Second World War during the Battle of the Coral Sea. There was an Australian ship, ship by the name of Canberra, the HMAS Canberra, the Australian ship that took a torpedo, on, deliberately took a torpedo gotten in its way that was meant for one of our carriers in the Battle of the Coral Sea during the Second World War. So, and then and was sunk. Mm. So uh, there was a, so the United States Navy decided that they would honor that action by naming a new cruiser after the Canberra that was lost, the HMAS Canberra that was lost. So there was a ship in the shipyard in Philadelphia uh, that was uh, supposed to be named the USS Pittsburgh. The Navy changed its name to the USS Canberra uh, in honor of Australia's capital city and the ship that went down. Wow. And, uh, and that ship later was you know, served in the Second World War in the Pacific uh, and uh, 
you know, earn many uh, battle stars. But then later, uh, well, in the late, in the around the mid 50s, the ship was brought out of uh, mothballs and converted to a guided missile ship. And that's the ship I served on uh, in 1958. I served 57, 58, 59 in those years. And uh, uh, we, we had a, a great, uh, uh, we called ourselves the, the, the can-do kangaroo <laughs> after the Australian name, you know? So, but it was it was an excellent uh, uh, group of people. I still I still communicate today with many of the people that I served with on that ship. Wow! And uh, so, but then when did you when yeah. did you next get on um, your? Tell us about your like your first or your second submarine tour. What was that like? Okay, on a submarine. Yeah, I went. Uh, I wound up going into the submarine service. When I uh, when the the Navy came out with a call for volunteers to submarine service, and uh, even though I was on uh, shore duty in Hawaii, I decided to put in uh, for for that. And they, then they wound up sending me to to uh, Groton, Connecticut, to where the the Navy's uh, submarine school is located. And uh, and I joined the wound up joining the submarine service by attending that school and graduating there. And it, I want to brag a little bit. <laughs> I graduated submarine school at first in my class. Wow! And congratulations, and was, uh, Carl. You went from yeah, and, never wanting to go to school to uh, <laughs> the, uh, the the brown noser. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was uh, that was un that was an unusual case. I was uh, one of the senior uh, people in the class, and uh, but still, uh, I enjoyed. I really enjoyed that uh, that training, and I I was. I, turns out, being a uh, someone who didn't like school, I was sent to another school right after that. <laughs> learn how to uh, learning uh, the electronics equipment that had to do with uh, nuclear submarines. And so uh, they sent me down to uh, Virginia, to Virginia Beach. And uh, with there, there was a uh, almost a year long training on uh, on the electronics uh, that are used, you know, to control and, and uh, operate the uh, nuclear submarines that were carrying the uh, fleet ballistic missiles, the missiles that uh, were, and are still in use today, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wound up, I went to that school and uh, I did uh, I did so well there that they didn't send me to a submarine afterwards. Instead, they kept me there to teach. Mm. So I wound up there teaching until turns out 1963 when the USS Thresher was sunk. At that point in time, I felt I needed to get out on a submarine. I felt so bad about all those men lost in a, you know, in a submarine accident that I, I wanted to get out there and uh, do something that was I thought was worthwhile. So I asked for a, a change of duty and asked for to be sent to a, a submarine for the first time a year or so after I had first went to submarine school. So, yeah, in fact, uh, no, that was almost two years after. Wow. And I wound up on a submarine uh, being built out of uh, at uh, New London, Connecticut, Groton, Connecticut, at uh, the electric boat division of General Dynamics shipyard. And that was the first uh, submarine that I was assigned to. And it was a 
nuclear submarine carrying fleet ballistic missiles. We carried uh, 16 missiles that were designed to, the whole purpose was to keep anyone, Russia specifically, uh, from starting a war. These, these ships were designed as uh, deterrent vehicles, would carry missiles and take them out at sea and take them close to enemy countries and keep submerged, stay hidden, but be out there as a deterrent to war. That if somebody started anything, that we could fire our missiles and never, and the people would never know where they came from. The whole idea for those kinds of submarines was to uh, prevent war from happening. Mm -hmm. So we were out there with all these uh, missiles at our command with the express purpose of not firing them. The idea was the, the, the whole concept, and there were, by the way, there were uh, 41 of these ships in those at that time in the late 60s and early 70s, 41 nuclear submarines out there with each, each carrying 16 missiles, which literally could have destroyed the world. And the whole purpose, of course, was to prevent anyone else from starting something. Is that where like that famous quote from Eisenhower came from? Um, Walk softly with a big stick? Well, yeah, actually, that was uh, that was uh, Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt that actually said that yeah. to begin with, but Eisenhower certainly carried the stick. <laughs> but uh, no, that's that's exactly right. Uh, our purpose was to remain silent, out there, undetected, and uh, and so that we could uh, we could destroy anyone that had started a war but uh, but in doing that the ships had to remain out there at sea all the time so how well, now long think about would you be how long would you be like completely submerged underwater for at one time what was that okay we were we'd go out on and each of these trips by the way were called a patrol and uh we'd go out and uh, for between, oh, 60, 70 days at a time, totally submerged, out of communication with the world. Talk about isolation. Now, this was back in the 50, 60 years ago when, uh, and we didn't have the, uh, the electronics that we do today, but it was still amazing what we did have. But we'd be out there totally submerged, never got a chance to look at the sun or the sky, even at night. Only one person could do that. And uh, staying out there and never popping out, out of the ocean for 60 to 70 days. Um. And uh, living together, about 120 men, 130 men, uh, living together in total isolation and uh, and you had to keep a good attitude because uh, if you didn't people wind up killing themselves <laughs> yeah no you had to you had to be friendly you had to know what you were doing and uh, and we had plenty of work to do as well keeping that ship safe mm. but uh, no we had great fun out there again uh spending much great time away from families we, that was the hard part away from families for two almost three months at a time any kind uh, at all no no contact whatsoever now today's world they they do have those those guys that are out there today they're still doing this by the way uh the navy is still doing this and they now have at least some communication back and forth with uh, satellite communication and so forth. 
back then we didn't. So we were totally incommunicado from our families for three months at a time. Oh. Uh, we could get, we could not contact them. We could receive information. We could get uh, messages from our families. Each man was allowed to get three messages in three months, one message a month. And the message had to be 15 words or less. A little difficult yeah. in isolation. I mean, what? you got a message that uh, was, most of it was, you know, uh, a guy's wife would send a met try to send a message, as much information in 15 words as possible. Yeah. Difficult. What was it? What what kept you what what kept you guys sane out there? Like what kept you guys <laughs> keeping that positive attitude? Like how did you guys do that? Well, you had to be half crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so what I I remember one one fellow uh, one fellow had a he decided he had a uh, well he had a pet alligator an invisible alligator. Okay, he he made a he made a leash you know, stiff leash uh, with a, you know, collar on the end of it. And he'd uh, carry that around with him all the time, everywhere he went on the ship. That was his pet invisible alligator. <laughs> and everywhere he went, you know, and people would all always ask him, you know, how's Albert? And <laughs> but, and he'd, he'd, he'd make people step out of the way because Albert was coming with him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Albert well, the at, alligator. <laughs> Albert the alligator. Well, at the end of the trip, when we finally got out, you know, got back on the on the pier, somebody asked him, and he didn't have his leash with him. You know, this guy didn't have his leash with him, and uh, somebody asked him, "Well, hey, where's Albert?" And the guy looked at him and said, "Who's Albert?" <laughs> <laughs> so, wait, was, was this guy? <laughs> Was this guy really, was he crazy or? Oh, no, he, he wasn't. He, he knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> <laughs> but so he was, made us laugh the entire time. Oh, uh, wow. So and what I'm getting, Arnold, is really with whatever you're given in life is, is make the best of it. And it's really your decision to do that. It's your decision to to have a positive mental attitude and focus on the positive things rather than po focus on the negative. Even when you can't see the sun, the sky, hear anyone in your family's voices for two to three months at a time, it's you guys were able to come up with ways to, in that environment, be, you know, stay, keep your sanity, keep your wits about you, and with these missiles on board that could destroy the world. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Wow. You, you, you have to. Uh, I mean, what's the alternative? Mm. The alternative is that you, you know, you drive yourself insane, really <laughs> insane. Not and, just and, uh, insane. That, that's just not an option. Um, so we're going to wrap this up in a couple of minutes here. Um, so I guess what I'm getting, what's worse, living on a submarine or being quarantined stuck at home? is well that's really up to you that's up to each people to decide of what their view is going to be what are they going to choose about that situation how are they going to live in that world um and, and that answer is different for everybody what they decide well that's that's true and that's like uh, uh what's the, the situation with uh, um the financial situation right now yeah i, I i've looked at my um uh, you know my accounts online and it, it's not the pleasant thing but but i i know that uh in the long haul that things are going to eventually uh, come out of this mm -hmm. and if you look back over the many many years of the stock market doing its thing uh that it's a steady steady increase no matter what so I, I look and I say, okay, yes, I'm losing some uh, monies right now, but given time, 
things will work its way out and people will you know will will gain back what we've lost we haven't lost it uh you know forever so i'm i'm very optimistic about what's going to happen given it you know it may not take uh months it may take more than months but that's okay uh, it, it, right now each one of us individually i can't control what's happening in the world so i can't worry about what's happening in the world it's kind of silly to worry when all you're worrying isn't going to change anything mm. so worrying doesn't do you much good but i have faith that uh that you know our system economic system certainly will will recover and uh yeah, I'm just uh, hoping for the best and knowing that uh, we'll come out of this okay. Thank you, Arnold. What what advice would you give for people out there listening right now? You know, whatever wherever you want to go with it, either financially or just in life, but what's going on right now? You know, what advice do you have for people? Well, my my advice is look at look at history. Look back over the last bunch of years. Yeah, we lost money back in uh, in 2008, but we recovered well from that. Given time, the stock market is broad enough to be able to uh, to come back from uh, these downturns. So, you know, it's, it's no point in trying to chase after what you think might happen. We don't have control over what's happening right now. So stay the course. Uh, that's my recommendation. And what and, about some life, life advice from your experience? Oh, life advice, again, look at the bright side. There's no point in being negative. You know, looking at the, at the d downside of things, like, oh, my God, am I going to get the, you know, the virus today? You know, what's going to happen? Uh, with this and that, you, we don't know what's going to happen. But having a, a good attitude, a bright, positive attitude, saying, look, there are good things that I can do today. All right. I can, uh, you know, learn something new today. Uh, one of the things that uh, I've decided I'm going to do is to learn a lot more about uh, uh, filling in a family tree of mine uh, for my my entire family. They have called and asked me to provide information about my our our ancestors and all of the other people that are around the world, literally around the world, uh, that uh, are part of our family. A lot of them don't know who who is part of the family. So I, I've decided to put together a, a family tree for the entire family and pass it around to everyone so that cousins who never knew about each other can learn about who's connected to them. Uh, so that, so that's the, and, and I'm learning some software to do that, learning some uh, computer software to get that done. Wow, that is awesome, Arnold. Looking again at the silver linings and your ability to always be up, you know, always be happy, optimistic, Look at the bright side is um, that's why I say every time I talk to you, I always feel better. So thank you for that. Um, and, and your software, you don't you saw the same computer you started with back in the 1990s? That's still running. <laughs> yes, I'm, check, I'm sitting here uh, <laughs> talking with you using a, uh, uh, a Windows 95 computer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same computer that I've used uh, when I was doing work from home, believe it or not, I've, I've done work from home for many years. Uh, and uh, it's one I started with in 1995. And still the same machine. Still works good. Don't make it. Still. Well, it works fine. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Arlen, thank you so much for your hope, your inspiration, entertainment. Um, thank you for everything. I really appreciate it. And um, our next um, our next webinar is we're going to do this again in two weeks. Um, and I'm going to talk about what I've learned from talking to over 100 different people during this time, what they've learned um, just in life um, and also a little tie in with investments and how financials fit into that. Um, so I'll send that information out to everyone. Please share it. Um, I really think if people come together, we can all get through things like this together. And, and it's easier to look on the bright side when we do it as a community together um, and know that people are all in it together. So please share these, get these out there, get this information out to the people. It's always going to be bright spots and positivity um, so we can all get through this. Um, again, everyone stay healthy, stay safe. Um, thoughts and prayers go out to all of you. Thanks for joining us. Um, Arnold, everyone else, please have a great rest of your day. Take care now. Thank you. Signing off. Bye now.